Carlos Urena Cecilio. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? A legend, an innovator, a very awkward person to work with, but his coffee is delicious, so he's kind of worth that extra effort. Let's find out more. My name is Steve Layton, and I travel the world finding amazing and delicious coffee for you to drink at home. Some make coffee difficult to understand and complicated, but here it's my job to make it easy and fun and tell you what's in my mug. So this farm, Finca La Pira, uh, is based in the high altitude area of the Dota Valley, which is in the Tarazoo region of Costa Rica, um, and for a long time was known as producing some of the greatest coffees in the world. Um, for me, Tarazoo lost a little bit of that in the, um, uh, in the last kind of 10, 15 years, when you've seen places like Central Valley and Western Valley doing a lot better. Um, but, like everything, when you start to lose that title of thing, I think the people are starting to work a little harder. We first found this coffee in the Cup of Excellence back in 2009, um, where I bought this lot as part of a buying group. Uh, and since then, we've carried on buying it, uh, uh, first of all, through an importer. Uh, now we're buying through an exporter in a much more direct relationship. Um, it's a fairly young estate for the Tarazoo region. It's only around about 50 years old, and it's owned by Cur uh, Carlos Urena Cicillino, um, who is the founder's son, uh, who has worked the farm for 18 years. However, he has worked in coffee for his whole life. Uh, he used to be a cupper at one of the co-ops. Um, after he inherited the farm, um, he, uh, Carlos worked the farm for many years, a certified organic, um, because you know, everybody thinks organic coffee is good, but he realized that it just wasn't possible on this farm. Now that's not to say that he uses lots of chemicals, um, but there are times where he's not able to use organic, 100% uh, organic uh, principles, but he still manages the farm in a way that is uh, very thoughtful to the environment and, and very kind. Like one of my favorite stories is that um, when we were on the farm uh, about 18 months ago, Carlos was saying to me, he likes the birds to be on the farm. And even though they eat the cherries, um, he says that the bird song makes the coffee plants happy. And if coffee plants are happy, then it's a good thing. Um, another story was he was using uh, sheep to roam freely around the, the coffee plants um, to eat the weeds um, because um, it was much better than using you know, some spray or something like that to, to cut that back. Um, he did also tell me that there were mobile fertilization, fertilization units, um, as nature is a wonderful thing. Um, but it's eliminated the need for herbicides for him on the farm, which is obviously a very, very good thing. Um, when, I, when I last visited the farm, Carlos was telling me about how he wakes up in the middle of the night and he comes up with an idea in his head on how he can improve the farm or how he can produce production or how he can produce, improve processing. Um, and um, I kind of too suffer from that same kind of thing where I have ideas popping in my head. So I think we kind of clicked over that a little bit, which was kind of quite cool. And we uh, empathized with each other's uh, difficulties. Um, during one of those late night bursts of inspiration, Carlos came up with the idea that he was gonna use cold water to uh, process the cherries. Now this is not anything new, but the way that he gets that cold water is kind of quite weird. So he has this zinc roof where he has water running down it and the wind from the, centra, uh, from the uh, Tarazoo Valley, the Dota Valley, comes through and chills the water uh -huh. and then it hits the cherries. Now, why is he doing that? Well, he decided that if, if you get an avocado and you try and cut the skin off the avocado and remove it from the seed, if it's cold, it's easier to remove it than if it's warm. And he was thinking that in the same way with coffee, that he, he removes the seed from the cherry with uh, the cold water, it's gonna work in a similar way. And I'm convinced that these little details is what makes his coffee so very, very special. Um, and you can taste all of these little attention to details um, in the cup. Um, but he's also an experimenter. So on the last visit to the farm as well, he's trying to do um, anaerobic fermentation, which is where you let the coffee ferment in a, a less yeasty kind of natural way and you slow it down. But instead of just doing that as well, he decided that he was gonna put cinnamon sticks in there. 
And I went along and picked up the parchment and smelt this poppy, and it's like a Cinnabon. It was just amazing. Um, but working with a genius like this is not easy. Every year I have to pester Carlos to give me some coffee. Every year I have to pester the exporter to get in touch with Carlos to get this coffee. And every year I visit and he promises me that I can have some coffee and then we still have the same argument. It's because it's a great farm. It's such a good farm and it's so much in demand that there's not just me looking for it, there's lots of other people. So the reason I wanted to focus on the tasting notes for this coffee is that I think they're so distinct and I think they also have a lot to do with the way that the coffee is processed. So you get lots of clarity and lots of sharpness and lots of cleanness. And I've already talked about that cold water and how that influences the way that the seed is removed from the fruit. You get like, like candied lemon peel. It's like sharp acidity, but it's sweet at the same time. Um, I get white sugar sweetness, which is just like just so clean and pure. And um, it just, it's a really clean cup. Um, and I can't help but thinking that the processing has a really big part on that. But then there's also the Costa Rican part in there. So, you know, it has this toffee stickiness that is just like so reminiscent of what a Costa good Costa Rican can be. Um, you know, I score this coffee a 90 and I sometimes feel I'm being a bit mean doing that uh, because actually it's a lot, lot, probably a couple of points more than that it should be. But like, it's just so clean and so sharp and so interesting. And that comes down to processing. Uh, so what I want to go on to now is to talk a little bit about uh, how coffee processing in Costa Rica is so unique and what the micro mills brought to that. So Costa Rica has a problem. Costa Rica is a fairly wealthy, well-run country that has fairly high paid jobs. So they have to charge more for their coffee to make it work um, and make sure that they're able to reach the prices that they want to reach. And a development that's helped Costa Rican coffee producers differentiate themselves from others is the proliferation of micro mills, or private wet and sometimes dry mills, normally wet mills, but we'll get into that, um, where individual producers or groups of smallholders will build their own mill in order to control um, lot separation of their own coffees. Um, and by investing in equipment such as depulpers, demucilogen machines, um, producers can harvest the pulp and process the coffee in a variety of ways without relying on a third party mill. Um, this has allowed them to reach into the specialty market and demand higher prices uh, whilst also keeping down their operating costs. Um, it's been a win-win for everybody that Costa Rican coffee has got better because they're able to really focus down on the detail. Um, and like we were talking about with Carlos earlier, they can experiment with things like uh, um, different fermentations and adding things to those fermentations, um, doing things like the water that he's doing. But what it also allows them to do is keep control of their costs. So they're not at the will or the whim of a big mill that may have busier times and quieter times when they're more keen or less keen to do business with them. So let's dive into this Lapira. Um, Kalita Brew this time. Um, I love flat bottom brewing. Um, I know lots of people swear by their V60s. I think Chemex does a better job than a V60. Uh, and I think Kalita is a great alternative to have something flat bottomed. But uh, by all means, feel free to write down your opinions on a piece of paper, scrunch them up, put them in the bin. They will make their way to me, I promise. Um, we are commemorating this episode, which is 489, with In My Mug episode 200 mug, which I can't remember who sent it me in. I've got a feeling I know, but I, I'm not going to embarrass myself. So if you're watching and you sent it in, please drop me an email. That one would be an interesting one. So the beauty of flat bottomed is I think you get a much more even extraction of the brew. Uh, with a cone, all the water ends up extracting everything through the bottom bit. Whereas here you get a little bit more of an even extraction. And I think it helps this coffee because you've got that candied lemon peel, which is so dominant. You have white sugar sweetness that really comes through, but it still has a stickiness and like a, almost like a toffee-like flavor and toffee-like texture to it. Um, the processing that um, they do on La Pira with this coffee really shines through in every single cup uh, and every single time that I drink it. Um, thank you for joining me. Please do come again. 
Um, and do remember, life is too short for bad coffee. <laughs>